Volume 3 Chapter 29 Shaltir's first task when her lord vanished was to deliver the Death Knights. When she passed through the gate and appeared again in the center of the Green Claw village, there were immediate outcries of happiness and relief that she had come back. However, when she was followed by the malice emitting Death Knights with their great tower shields and swords as long as a lizard man was tall, cries of dread came up uniformly from the ranks. Shivering and dread from their numbers was so overwhelming that even when the lizardmen descended to their knees and bowed their heads, the shadows cast by the central bonfire revealed shadows that shook like leaves in a breeze. The guard complement on the walls was copious, and the walls themselves had been raised by several feet. In addition, Shiltier noticed that sharp wooden stakes were embedded in various locations and at various heights several feet back from the dirt mounds which she disdained as subpar security. She ignored their fear to point at the sharp wooden spikes thrusting out of the ground. What are those? She asked, looking down at the lizard man bearing the blue sword. Frog traps, Lady Shiltier, Zarius who said without raising his head, the frogmen like to jump over walls, I thought that if they are so eager to impale themselves, let them. Shiltier furrowed her brow and let her imagination work, the weird running creatures reaching the wall, leaping over, crying for blood. One horrified moment when they looked down and saw the rows of spikes waiting for them, then impaled by their own weight and dragged down the base. It was a slow, painful, brutal way to die. I love it. Shiltier thought and looked down at the lizard man who spoke. This was your idea? She asked, blinking her crimson eyes as she looked at the unassuming lizard meat. Yes, my lady. Do you not approve? He asked of her, and to that she shook her head. No, it is a marvelous idea. You're one to watch. She remarked with a smirk. Th thank you, my lady. Zarya so half replied and half questioned, he was rife with uncertainty made worse by the malice riddled beings at her back. May I ask what purpose those beings have? He pressed his luck by asking, but clearly pleased by his torturous weapons, she reached up and patted one of the death knights on the waist. Its dark flesh gave under the seemingly light touch of the armored vampire, she grinned down at the lizard man. Your security. These will help protect you both while my master works, and after my master leaves. You will belong to him now, be grateful. The king over Nazareth deems you worthy of serving him, Shiltir shouted her proclamation into the deepening darkness of the quiet night, the crackling of flame seemed to applaud her and cast the dread shadows of the death knights long over the reassembled body of lizardman tribals. Where is our new lord, my lady? Shajariu inquired, daringly raising his face to meet her eyes despite the look of hate from the death knight which was still radiating violence enough to make the bravest lizardman quiver with terror. He has returned home for the night and will come back in the morning, when he does. You will follow him to the heart of the Frogman territory and prove that you deserve to exist. Shiltir's eyes fell over the masses. The world eats the weak, if you want the protection of the strongest in the world. Prove it and then be grateful he acknowledges you. Shiltir's words dripped like venom from the fangs of a snake, but if it was venom, it was sweet and charming venom that struck the hearts and souls of the lizardman like flint to flint, it ignited a spark which caught fire in their hardy souls. We will, Lady Shiltir. We will. Zaryasu and Shajariu shouted, and their outcry of promise was taken up by the others until it became a mix of religious intonation and battle cry. We will. We will. We will. We will. We. Will. We. Will. The chant went on, and the lizardmen began to rock back and forth in a rhythmic pattern that synchronized together that seemed to slowly become a form of eerie worship. Shiltir watched as their eyes became glassy, distant and a zeal came into them very slowly but surely, which reminded her of the human test subjects. Like the ones who defeated the Empire Champions. Fanatics. Good, very good, it is just what my master deserves. Shiltir's sense of satisfaction as well as her lord's ability to inspire devotion continued to rise as she opened the gate again. Take these death knights and use them to protect yourselves, when our master comes back, there will be a lot of work to do. Maybe he will even consider rescuing those captives of yours that the frogmen have already taken. He's got them running home right now, and no doubt that the survivors he kept he took of your people are kept guarded. You have nothing to worry about though, these will obey you. All you have to do is sit and wait. If you want to be rescued, that is. She let the statement hang. We will. They answered, then Shiltier stepped through the gate and was gone. You heard Lady Shiltier. 
Zarius who spoke up immediately when she vanished, we're to go and rescue our people with these death knights, by the command of the king of Nazarick to prove ourselves worthy. He shot to his feet and raised his frozen sword skyward. For a moment all was stillness and silence. Only the huffing noise of the undead broke the moment, and the crackling of the bonfires sent sparks of glowing orange into the air where it flickered and died away. Finally he spoke, extending his hand outward toward the other chiefs, you heard her, maybe he will rescue them, and we must prove we are worthy and use these death knights to protect ourselves. He looked the chiefs over, this was a warning. If we won't rescue our own people, why should he bother to rescue any of us at all? Shajriu thought that over, his brother had never looked stronger, more certain, and the more the statement went through his head, the more true it seemed like it could be. Crush Lulu, for a moment as her red eyes focused on the lizard man she was rapidly growing to love, believed he'd gone mad. But as he made his argument and held his sword aloft while six impossibly strong monsters stood ready to defend the village, she believed. Some of our people are captives, leaving them there, waiting for a king to save us after he bestows us with weapons that could rescue them. After he gives us the means to protect ourselves? No. We would shatter all faith and confidence in us that he now holds. His emissary's words were cryptic, but we must act or be forever held in contempt. Then we have to go. Chiefs. We take one of these creatures with us, and then we alone rescue the captives. Crush spoke up and shot to her feet while the words tumbled out, tails began to pound the ground in unison, and the motion carried the night. Volume 3 Chapter 30 Heketi looked over her shoulder again, and again and again. Each time she did, she had to slow down the pushing of her legs as she moved over the lake. Getting from one end to the other was easy if one was in no hurry, but they had to race against the undead. The churning silt at the base of the lake disguised the truth of their numbers, while the water impeded the motion of the already heavy undead former knights. However, I saw, we all saw. If this many reach our unguarded homes, the shudder that ran through the queen had nothing to do with the temperature of the water that surrounded her body as she moved through the deep. She slowed down again, her people simply could not keep up with her, too weak. Too weak. When I have the lake I will have to change that. She added that to the list of things she had to do. The endless swim was normally a peaceful thing for her, a time of reflection when she could think about all she'd done and all she would yet do. Now as she ran through her memories, she was desperately searching for an idea that would ensure that they could triumph, and perhaps find a clue in her memory's deepest recesses for what caused the dead of the Empire to rise and come for her people. Bringing the chiefs of all the frogmen together under her reign took up the bulk of her memories. Snatching up the many eggs, the small skirmishes that disguised the great operation of capturing egg clutches. So many daring raids. Thanks to her clever stratagem of mixing all the many tribes' eggs together so that nobody knew whose eggs were whose, and so all had to be valued equally. And all under her watch. She knew the whispers of her people. They whisper of my genius, of the power I brought to them all, and it made me proud. Perhaps too proud? Could I have foreseen this? He Ketty asked as she pushed ahead and slowed down again to let her army catch up. She'd asked herself that many times, but each time she failed to see how. No. There was no way I could have foreseen this. I made no enemy that I know of who could raise so many undead. Finally free of the threat of the Empire and what do we get? An amphibious army of Empire soldiers controlled by someone else instead. How? Still no answers came as darkness descended over the lake and she was only kept company by the noise of her legs kicking against the surface of the water whenever she broke through to look desperately ahead. It was nearly dawn by the time she reached the outskirts of her patrols. Her powerful deep voice broke the morning stillness, her patrols spun to look in her direction as their queen shouted to them all. Raise the alarm. Bring everybody to the crest. Be ready to fight. Everyone who can bear a club or a hammer. Pride swelled in her throat as they did not even stop to ask questions, their feet splashing loud through the low waters as they jumped back toward the interior of the great village that held most of her population's members. Send word to the outskirts, call in all the reserves from the other villages. The undead. Thousands of undead, he Ketty cried and stood as soon as the water level was low enough that she had to in order to continue forward. The frogman's deep cries riveted in alarm as word spread and the heavy warriors put away their spears, going for heavy clubs, militia and warriors were the next to fall in after her elites, followed by the younger males and the much older ones as well. The frogmen darted their eyes around with fear, 
looking over the placid lake as their queen jumped in front of their ranks. We have only a few hours, the water slows them, the rest of the army follows me. Now hurry and prepare, get the youngest clear, everyone who can fight, must fight. The frogman settlement was far more than a village now, despite them thinking of it as such, and to better aid the watery settlement's security and establish clear boundaries, many trees had thick, oil-hardened vines bound to one another. These vines were packed tight between the bases of trees and one after another ran higher as far as the trees would allow. Where trees had been removed or were inadequate, large stone posts or wooden stakes had been embedded deep into the soft lake bottom to allow the vine fences to continue. To add to this security in times of danger, the residents began to drop stones and stray wood or other debris on either side of the vine fencing to make it difficult to climb or cut at the support, and these were in turn secured by more poles that would hold the front into place. If these security posts were breached it would create a collapse of the fronts of the walls that would briefly break the momentum of an enemy charge, identify a point of danger, and allow others time to respond, while the stack behind the vines allowed extra space for the frogmen to stand and fight with the high ground to help them. In addition, some trees held platforms which had caches of rocks or heavy wood that could be thrown as crude missiles against those attacking the walls. There was no single gate as every frogman could simply jump over the lowest part of the wall and anything they wanted to haul could be taken up slowly. Vastly better defenses than those pathetic lizardmen. Hiketi reassured herself with pride as her warriors jumped to the tops of the walls. The first and fastest of her army arrived not long after the ones left behind had assembled and taken positions along the walls, and more began to arrive after that, their bulbous faces and throats emerging from the waters, followed by their powerful broad bodies and strong, thick legs. They came in ones, twos, dozens, then hundreds. Many were worn out, exhausted from the desperate swim home, but they outdid the undead which were slowed by both armor and having to run on the sinking silt bottom of the lake. New arrivals rest, everybody else keep watch, he Ketty bellowed the order and took her position at the center. The villagers from the smaller surrounding communities began to stream in after that, coming from farther away, some took more than an hour, some took three, but with their great hopping bounds, they came on in a steady and desperate stream. He Ketty watched from her place at the top of the wall as they formed up in small units of their own and various chiefs put them into position. My people are brave, we will defeat the undead, we will defeat the lizardmen, we will secure the lake and claim our future. Hiketi repeated the promise to herself, and then when she looked off into the distance of the placid lake she saw the darkening come into view. The darkening, she knew, was the churned up silt of thousands of undead. Her heartbeat picked up its desperate pace and she felt many large eyes focused upon her and her alone, seeking guidance, reassurance, and strength. What to say? It was an eternal question, something, anything to buck up their spirits in the decisive hour. Finally she hit upon something, her own words to reassure herself. She held her great long spear overhead in both thick green webbed hands and shouted to them all, We will defeat the undead. We will defeat the lizardmen. We will secure our future in this world. Nothing, not alive, not dead, not undead will bar our way through. This lake is ours. Let no one take it from us. Great ribbiting roars met hers as clubs were briefly held aloft and shouts of defiance hurled toward the darkening waters. Some who carried wooden shields smacked their clubs in place for extra noise, but Hiketi cared nothing for noise, she was focused on the darkness in the once blue waters. The first undead heads began to rise up, their twisted faces, some bearing little flesh, and others fleshless, just naked white bone, stared through empty eyes at the living frogmen. They were slowed still by the silt. The sound of splashing water picked up till the noise of droplets falling from their bodies were so numerous that it sounded like a roaring rain to the waiting frogmen defenders. The undead knights spied the defenders in a great mass, howled their rage and hatred for the living, and then with their swords raised aloft as if they still remembered their warrior lives, they charged. Here they come. Hold your place, or lose everything, he Ketty shouted the final order and raised her spear to swing it down and begin the fight in earnest. Volume 3 Chapter 31 The undead became so numerous that as the sun's ascent continued across the sky, its light glinting off the armor made the lake look invisible under the reflection of light off steel. The frogmen on the wall swung their clubs back and forth with desperate, wild abandon, smashing against steel helmets with wooden clubs, the finest of which had stones embedded in the middle of their heads. 
Hiketi lost sight of the fighting in various places, remaining as she did at the center. Her strongest warriors used all their martial arts to fend off the onslaught, and the mindless undead hacked at the wooden barriers, splashing churned up mud and blood into a reddish-brown mix. Every time a frogman's foot was caught or a stray sword pierced an exposed belly, the undead swarmed and tore the living to shreds before the eyes of their very comrades. The undead were strong and full of hate, devoid of weariness or fear, they would not stop, there was no pulling back for them, just a single charge of Duorundi. Little by little, the undead began to scale the wall. More than once they were kicked far back into the waters by powerful frogman legs. Though the, the undead fell in piles when a powerful blow sent them flying back like projectile weapons instead of enemies. The platforms that served as throwing positions quickly ran out of rocks, and the warriors who were slain for the second time began to tumble in greater numbers. Hiketi fought on, never leaving her position, while her warrior elites did the same, the others switched out. Some fighting for an hour or more before drawing back for a brief rest, serving in rotations on the wall. The screams of her people suddenly went up in horror just out of her view. Her sharp hearing told her what it was. A breach. At least partial. Part of the wall gave way. It became a brutal fight as warriors who had not gotten a complete break, jumped from where they sat and leapt high through the air to fall on the undead, the weight of their bodies, clubs, and gravity coming down hard on the first undead to enter the breach and for the present, stopping the advance. How much longer? Hiketi asked as she smashed the end of her spear into the head of another undead, her weapon crunching into an unguarded skull, dropping the undead where he stood, while another simply took his place. The armor of the undead made it harder, the undead could only be put down by taking or smashing heads, and many of those were still armored. Her warriors were growing weary. I wonder if they've run out of martial arts yet. If they haven't, they will soon. More shouting, more screams. This within view, Hiketi saw out of the corner of her eye where the undead successfully pulled a few defenders down into the undead-dominated side, and reached the top of the wall. Fill the breach, she cried, but it was a needless order. Another weary group of frogmen pushed off with their mighty legs and sword to land atop the undead, swinging their clubs with wild desperation briefly gaining a few precious inches of space between the precious frog eggs that were probably already evacuated, and the undead that would certainly trample them. The thick knot of her males at a break in the wall were lightly reinforced as the eldest of the elder frogmen charged in to support their sons and grandsons, they were strictly speaking, expendable. The young were vital, and the old threw themselves into the fray to protect the future, a gift from the past to those who wanted to forge ahead into the future. Elder Frogman died screaming as human swords and bony human hands tore into the thick frogman muscle and ripped their legs open until they were torn from their bodies. And yet for all the bloody stinking horror, Hiketi could only feel pride in their courage as the elders threw their lives away without fear for the pain they were enduring to buy their young even one more minute of life. The stink of blood was thick in her nostrils, and the blue water began to turn an almost violet shade as it was blended with the churned up silt and blood of frogmen that had fallen to the front of the wall. One of her elite champions yelped in sudden horror, he cast a brief glance at Hiketi, an undead climbing up from below grabbed at his vine armor and yanked, he began to fall, and the undead with it. Her hand thrust out and grasped him from the back, for just an instant he hung there, suspended between the throng aching to tear him apart, and the safety of the queen he was protecting. Two swords pierced his vocal sack as he had fallen too low, and blood began to pump out, she felt him go limp in her hands and she almost let him go. No. He is mine. He catty told herself and yanked the body backward, he fell to the other side of the wall, an armored corpse whose fears and hopes were over with the moment of his passing. He couldn't float in the low waters, but the ripples echoed out from his body as if he might still stir to rejoin the fight. The noise and screams of living and undead continued unabated, but even while her people began to weaken, she saw the truth, the truth came in the form of more undead, that clinches it. Someone did this, those had to have come from where the other positions would see them. They were fewer in number, a few hundred undead knights at most, but they emerged from the waters as the bulk of the first horde had, and added their howls of hatred and their strength to the fray. From where she stood, the queen could see another breach begin to open up. Hold on. Hold on. Just a little bit more. We've almost won. She screamed the admonition to her weary people, 
most couldn't see the reinforcements. Fighting was now on the ground. Some undead broke through in places and were running among the interior huts of the settlement, tearing into anyone living that had not made an escape or rejoined the fight. Screams of her dying frogmen were behind her, before her, and on either side of her. Heketi swung her spear again, and put down another. The only thing holding her people in place was that there was nowhere to jump to that would promise safety. The undead would never tire, never stop chasing them, but their spirits couldn't hold forever. She never knew who the first of them was whose courage fled, but somewhere along the wall, it happened. She caught sight of one of her own not running, but leaping wildly away, using his comrades to buy him time to save his own life. He Ketty cursed the nameless one. May you die alone, and live long enough to regret this day. She hurled her hatred at the one she counted as a coward who left his brothers to die, and yet he was not the last. Just a little bit more. Will you leave your queen to die? She admonished her soldiers, and though some said yes, they would leave her to die as they hopped and fled into the distance with not even a weapon to burden their escape, others continued with desperate courage. It was then that she saw it. More bodies began to emerge from the waters. No. Not more. No more. No more. She begged the gods of the lake to spare her more, until she saw more clearly what they were when the stirring waters parted. A roaring ribbit of reinforcements hit the air. The undead had no sense of strategy and left nothing to guard their flanks, nor did they keep order and maintain the pressure on the walls. Instead they charged the nearest targets which brought the frogmen on the wall a moment to breath. The frogmen reinforcements hopped onto the attackers with wild frenzied killing intent, though they had only crude clubs rather than ones prepared for military use, they nonetheless had something. They hit hard and drew pressure from the wall, the undead on even ground seemed initially to still have the advantage. But the frogmen were fresh and nimble, leaping over the battle area, splashing into waters or luring the undead into deeper areas where they could be isolated and killed. A useless effort when the numbers of undead were many, but reduced by hours of fighting, they were more manageable for the fresh forces. We reinforced. Attack. 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 Hiketi called for her weary warriors to sally forth and strike, and those who remained, followed their queen as she jumped off the wall as high and far as she could. Her spear held aloft like a goddess of war, she landed on an undead and smacked his head clean off his neck, sending it far out into the lake to sink to the bottom with the weight of its helmet to carry it down. Thus inspired, the frogmen bellowed with desperately renewed vigor and followed suit, abandoning the walls and closing in on the undead from all sides, entangled and insensible among one another, the undead began to fall like flies. From there, the noise and undead screams of hate began to diminish. Thousands had been reduced to hundreds, hundreds to dozens, and at long, long last, there was only one, the desperate undead knight knew only to tear at flesh until the end, and it charged Heketi with a will that would have been called courage had it been from a living being. She thrust her spear home, catching the helmeted head through the eye socket, and yanking back so hard that his head was torn free and sent sailing high overhead to land somewhere within their settlement. The undead body fell with a splash into the waters, and for a moment the whole of the remaining frogman army was utterly silent. It was over, the queen raised her spear overhead, and as if that were some signal on which they had all been waiting, they held their clubs up and shouted a victory roar. Hecate! 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 They chanted their queen's name like a war cry, but towering over them as she did, she received their cheers only reluctantly. At her back she could see that the blue waters had been stained with blood so copiously that they were nearly violet, an ugly bruise like shade, dozens of feet out from the remnants of the wall. How many? How many remain in my army? She had no answer, and once again, an unanswered question filled her with a dread she could not escape. 